speaker. So Heather, hello, it's good to see you. Welcome. I know you're very busy right now. Uh, yes. Hi, Anne. It's good to see you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yes, we're in the um, middle of a special session right now, so busy time. Yeah, well, thank you. And so this is going to be short. We're going to record about a half hour, and then Heather needs to run back to caucus. So Heather, I understand that you've been working in mental health for your career. You're a therapist. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yes. Um, so yeah, I, I previously have worked um, as a cognitive behavioral therapist, so outpatient mental health therapy. Um, so did that for years and then um, had children and worked with them a lot and then became really active in my community. Again, working um, on a lot of, of things that actually really were tied to mental health. Um, but with that being said, when I was elected two years ago, uh, mental health was, of course, a really important topic for me. Um, mm -hmm. And so, one second, I apologize, my dog is attacking. Um, <laughs> my dog is That's attacking. Okay. Yes. We'll edit that part out. <laughs> so not really, we're not editing that out. <laughs> you don't have to edit that out. That's This is real life. So the one thing that we've learned about COVID right. is that, you know, we, life is messy. And I think in mental health, um, mental health can be very messy. And I think that we need to be honest with each other about who we are and that things are not always perfect and scripted. Um, and so mm -hmm. I, as a legislator, I really legislate that way. Um, but in mental health, that that is, and our imperfections and all these things make us really, um, that's life. So uh, mm -hmm. with that said, um, when I came in two years ago to the legislature, I represent Edina, Minnesota. And uh, one of the things that was really important for me was uh, to, to really look at mental health and be honest with how we were approaching it. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the things that I've worked on are expanding what we know works. Um, so data shows that school-linked mental health works. So working with uh, NAMI, uh, w which is an organization at the Capitol, so uh, mm -hmm. that works a lot on mental health, and Sue Abder Holden uh, is fantastic and such a huge advocate for patients. Um, I've worked with her on school-linked mental health. We Just this last year, we worked on um, rewriting the statute of the civil commitment uh, statute because we want to make sure that patients have their say. Um, civil commitment mm -hmm. is a very challenging topic. It's so hard for the patients. It's so hard for the families. Um, so a, a really uh, tough topic to take on, but an important one. Uh, other things that I've worked on, um, expanding teacher or uh, therapist of color grants, um, but it's really mm -hmm. important. There's so many legislators, legislators, whether or not they have a background in being a therapist like I do, um, a lot of people, mental health speaks to everybody. Um, and I think the beautiful part mm -hmm. about the last decade is that we've been more open about talking about how mental health impacts all of us and how we don't have to hide from it. Uh, and so I think that's right. that's a really important piece to, to, you know, to think about. And I think for um, people as you, Anne, are, are, you know, talking to your constituents and people in your area, um, I'm sure that will be an issue that will come up so often, especially now under with COVID uh, and mm -hmm. what COVID has done to our mental health. Are you hearing that a lot from people in your community? Yes. Yeah, so right now, because the DFL is not allowing us to door knock, I'm calling people at night. And um, I enjoy that very much. I will talk to two or three people a night who tell me that they're just so lonely and isolated you know, mostly this, these are, it's not just elderly people. It's people who don't have a partner who live alone. And I think that this, this time is really hard on grownups, but it's also really hard on kids. Um, so I've seen that a lot. Um, I teach at the U and I was telling Sam, uh, who's also a student at the U that um, I have 22 students, 20 of my students just disappeared during the time that we were doing online learning. They, um, they turned in their homework, they got passing grades, but in terms of interaction, which I think is a big part of learning, they have dropped out. And I saw it with my own two college age daughters. I saw them get really anxious and kind of spiral downward into this place of depression and anxiety about it, which I think is alleviated when they have interaction with their peers. So mm -hmm. I think it's a hard time right now. And um, I appreciate your, your insight. Did you run for the house because you wanted to see changes based on your expertise? Was that one of the driving motivators for you to get involved? Absolutely. I mean, I, so I represent Edina, but I, I talked a lot about my story um, 
and how imperfect my story was again, because I really truly believe in this idea of embrace just who we are um, and speak our truth. And so I, I grew up to a single mom um, and my mom uh, struggled with alcoholism and mental health and um, just lots of addiction in my house growing up. And we were really poor. And uh, I, I think about um, when I was 12, talking to a therapist on my own. And I think a lot of people that are therapists can say this in their story that they typically, they have, uh, they saw a therapist and that inspired them to be mm -hmm. one. Um, so I remember a, a therapist going to see one when I was 12 years old and how she just really helped me understand that what I was feeling was okay and uh, that mm -hmm. I was strong regardless of those feelings and I could move on and I could be mm -hmm. successful regardless of those feelings because I thought I felt a lot of shame um, and I think for a lot of my life too I, I, I wanted to be somebody who I was and I wanted to fit what society thought was a successful person and so for me uh, mm -hmm. mental health definitely plays a role in that. Yes. And I think just, you know, being yeah. who we are and accepting people for who they are, uh, is really important. And so it's kind of that empowering strength-based, um, view that our stories are what makes us strong. Our stories are what mm -hmm. makes us strong. So that's really why I ran, but yeah, absolutely. Um, mental health ha in, in just being truthful, um, was was a part of why I decided to run for office. Yeah. How do you feel you've made the biggest impact? Tell me what you've done since you were elected. Well, that's... and I love that you have the sun like the closing I in know, on you. I know. Feel like, free to move. It's trying to scoot over, <laughs> and I am um, okay. It's there okay. we go. Um, the, the largest, the biggest thing that I've done um, uh, is is really. Um, oh, I'm, I'm seeing a question here pop up. Uh, hi, Heather. Philip from Edina. He has a question about autism. Yeah, and do a lot of autism awareness, education, and advocacy. I'm concerned about the many mental health issues. Yes, Philip, I am concerned too. So right now, actually, uh, Philip, to answer your question, we have a bill about um, autism awareness and actually working with police officers um, mm -hmm. and making sure officers get trained on the education of, uh, of autism. And so you raise such a good point because there's so much um, that people don't know about autism. Um, mm -hmm. There's things that I honest, honestly feel that I, I learn every day too. So I think uh, it, it's a great question and I would absolutely love to talk with you more, but I do know that it's in one of our packages, uh, making sure mm -hmm. that officers have training too. Um, because as we look at public safety uh, over the last few weeks, that is definitely an issue that we've heard numerous times at the Capitol. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would say autism education is important for a lot of people, um, I teach at the university, I teach in engineering, and I actually have had several autistic students. I've had several students on the autism spectrum. I don't have any training in that. I'm a mother and I have relatives and niece, uh, nephew who's autistic. So I had some personal experience, but I think if you're not trained in dealing with the broad spectrum of autism, you can misunderstand some of that behavior to be um, different than what the intent is. And so I think that's really important from, especially with the police, there's so much at stake if there's a misunderstanding. You know, as a teacher, if I misunderstand, you know, I might, there's a communication background or breakdown, but I think for the police, that's really important. So. Absolutely. And I, and it just passed, uh, Philip just mentioned that it passed the, the Senate, or it just passed the Senate. Uh, Philip, we're bringing it up, I believe, tomorrow night in the House. So 5 p.m., definitely tune in. It's going to be a long night. Um, Good you for know, you. Thing, yeah. The other thing, Ian, I just want to talk about, because we're living through right now this pandemic, and it has been so hard for people because it's altered our routines. Mm -hmm. And I don't know about you, Ann, but I'm big into routines. I like my, like getting up <laughs> in the morning and having my coffee. And I like, you know, I like to know what my, what's on the calendar for the day. And I think mm -hmm. people were programmed that way. What COVID has done is put fear in our communities. Mm -hmm. It has, it has ruined our routines. Um, mm -hmm. And we're trying to, you know, come at, create new ones. Um, it's created anxiety and stress and, you know, worry. People are worried about their financial stress that they mm -hmm. haven't felt in a long time. There is um, health stress. 
there's yeah. success of not, and you know, like the relationships are so important. You had mentioned that, Ann, and that's so intuitive and it's so right on because what we know and data shows this is that the more social we are, the, the better we feel. The more mm -hmm. social supports. When somebody would come to my office, I would say, well, tell me about, one of my main first questions was, tell me about your social supports. Tell me about mm -hmm. your support network because it's so important that we don't feel alone. And right, right. now we're living this complicated time where people feel isolated. They don't mm -hmm. know if, and, and everybody feels this way, right? And so you're trying to figure mm -hmm. out what's a safe way. So when we say socially distance, it's more like, well, maybe physically distance, but don't socially distance. And so figuring out different ways that we can learn from this moment. Um, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very challenging time and, you know, meeting people with where they're at. Uh, what's, how is your day? And, you know, when somebody always says, fine, every time I'm like, no, you're not. Be honest with me. I don't know if you're always fine. So I think, um, I think, you know, people will say to me and I'll be like, oh, fine. And then I'm like, actually, no, I'm not fine. Let me tell you mm -hmm. why. Yeah, Let me tell you why. absolutely. Like, yeah. Being honest with one another is really important. So what are you working on right now at the Capitol that might impact people's mental health or ability to cope with things uh, aside from the autism training for police officers? Can you think of anything else you want to share? Yeah, yeah, we absolutely are working. Um, there's some mental uh, mental health bill. So I'm on public, I'm vice chair on public safety. And uh, we, so we have 18, uh, you know, looking at a package of 18 different bills. And in there, there mm -hmm. are some peer counseling. Uh, there's a husband sighting. See, this is real life. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, there is a, a peer to peer support um, mm -hmm. bill. So, officers, another thing that we don't talk about often enough is that officers um, don't get the mental health support they need. So, mm -hmm. it's not only need them to know about all these different we, the calls for mental health have increased exponentially. Um, and you start looking at it, it, looking at that and you're like, well, what is that? What's the correlation there? Well, so like, let's look at the history and start breaking it down in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So we called for um, institutions to start closing in, in about like mid 1970s. Um, so no more institutional hospitals, right? So right now right. we only have like one main uh, mental health, well, two hospitals uh, really, but St. Joseph's the biggest. Um, um, but we closed all these institution on mental health. And I, I don't disagree with that. I think it was, you know, we have to value people's life. Um, but what mm -hmm. we didn't do, we said, well, let's close all these hospitals and let's move people into the communities and we'll push in supports. And what Sue from NAMI says, who I, I love when she says this, because it could not be more true, is we've never built a mental health structure a real safety net for people. So we mm -hmm. closed all those hospitals. We said we'll push in community supports, but you know what we didn't do, Anne? We didn't really build it. Yeah. We didn't build it. And you start looking at too, at what we have in terms of our mental health parity, even how we reimburse practitioners is not the mm -hmm. same as any other health practitioner that you, you go and see. Um, and so we have to look at mental health as holistically um, as a part of your health. It is a part of your physical health. If your mental health is not mm -hmm. doing well, do you know what happens? Yep. Your physical health isn't doing well because it is your mind is the part of your body. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes because of our history and this, we're, we're inching our way, but we really have to change the conversation um, about why that is. Mm -hmm. Also push for better, uh, better answers and more mm -hmm. accountability and for change. What is it, Anne, that makes you care about mental health? If, I'm just curious. <laughs> Well, I think my experience recently, specifically, I have two daughters who are in their 20s. Mm -hmm. One of them has some depression issues, and her support structure for therapy is at college. So she was sent home, and she lost all of her support structure. She lost everything that was fun about her life, and she was stuck in her house, in her childhood bedroom, with her parents 24-7, and it was about a week into it. Then I said, you need to be back in your therapy. You need to make sure that you're um, talking to somebody because the isolation was extremely challenging for her. So I've, I've watched her struggle. Um, thankfully, she has a job and she was able to go back to that. And for me, it wasn't even about as college is not even, I've taught at the university for over 25 years. College is not about learning. And I have fought the movement towards online learning for everything. 
now this year we were thrown into it because I think college is so much more and school is so much more than learning facts. It's about learning how to interact. It's about positive reinforcement from each other. It's, it's about so much. So I saw that with my own students. I saw my 22 students just, as I said, you know, 90% of them disappeared. And so I think this is a big, I, I mean, I don't know how old your kids are, but I, I worried about my nieces and nephews who were supposed to graduate and they did, but it's not the same. I mean, we have certain traditions and certain expectations of childhood and to have that taken away, I think it's been hard. And I, I would argue that it's not about, oh, your kids have, didn't get graduation, big deal. Like, I, that's a big deal. I think when you're a child and your whole world is school and then school is taken away, I think that's a big deal. So it, I'm just thinking about it right now. I'm thinking about the people that I'm talking to on the phone who don't have housemates. I think it's a hard time. And um, I'm thinking about police brutality and all that we're expecting them to do. I'm thinking about the people with mental health challenges that I have seen in public and it's been really scary. I'm not equipped to deal with them. So I think it's important that as a society, we, we figure out ways to support people who need help and equip people who want to be the helpers. So that's where I'm coming from. I think that's great. I, I think you would be such a welcome addition and, and so <laughs> at the Capitol. Um, <laughs> we need it. And the best policymakers, if I'm honest with you, are not the ones that have all the solutions. It mm. is the ones that are willing to listen and find out what truly the problems are so that you can find solutions. Um, my grandpa used to always say to me, the know-it-all doesn't know anything. And yeah. so it, it, I always thought that was, that was, that was funny. And as I, when I came to the Capitol, it, it couldn't ring more true. Um, the most important thing that we can do as lawmakers is listen to our communities and mm -hmm. to people. Um, the, the pain right now in our communities is real. It's yeah. real. And the solutions, um, I don't have all of them, but I promise that I'm dedicated to figuring out how we can improve people's lives. And I can see that you are too. And so I think that's really wonderful. I just want to I think it's a Oh, sorry, go ahead. Do we have another question? Yeah, it says many autistics. I think this is from um, Philip Stell. Yeah. So PCAs come in to help and other supports during COVID. Yep. Yep. What can be and done I to get agencies to provide supports during this pandemic crisis time? Oh, Philip, that <laughs> is a really good question. We're having the same thing with nursing homes. Um, we just, people are really scared to go into other people's homes. They're really scared to go into a nursing homes. This is that fear, um, that anxiety, that worry. Um, people are scared for their, their health. And so um, mm -hmm. I think we have to, that is absolutely an issue that the Department of Health and the Department of Human Services is thinking about right now. I did talk to um, somebody from the Department of Human Services last week. It's a huge issue right now. And so mm -hmm. we know that, Philip, we know it. Um, we're trying to figure out what to do. Um, but it's, it's, it's a tough thing. I mean, a lot of people don't mm -hmm. uh, been helping with businesses reopen safely and talk about mental health. There again is people don't feel safe. And so we, but we need to reopen the economy. So you're like, well, how do you find that balance? Mm -hmm. It's, it's not easy. It's not easy. Um, mm -hmm. but we have to find our way and we have to create that new normal mm -hmm. and we do have to get people mm -hmm. into a new routine because that will help all of us. Right. That's right. And I think the reality that PCAs right now don't make very much money, you have to wonder why, you know, I mean, it's hard enough to go to job when you feel supported and you feel like the infrastructure is there and you feel like you're being compensated fairly. But when you have a PCA who's already not being adequately paid and now they're willing, they're being asked to trade in their their health or their parents' health for that, it's not worth the risk. So I think that is a real big problem. So anyway, well, what do you have ahead of you um, in session? What can we expect in the next few days? Anything you wanna share? Um, next few days, we'll be having public safety bills come up. We will have a local city government, um, uh, the CARES Act. We'll be having some money come through with that. Um, as of right now, that hopefully a bonding bill, but I haven't, we haven't have a, we don't have a definite on that. So really that's 
all we anticipate. I mean, maybe a few other things, but right now that's up in the air. I'm, I'm really hoping on this education bill because it actually does have a mental health piece in it. Um, in addition mm -hmm. to, it works a lot on anti-vaping, um, trying to stop kids from starting um, on vaping, but there is a mental health provision for um, teachers uh, to learn more because teachers are on the front line. Uh, you know that, Anne, as mm -hmm. a teacher yourself, um, and you are, you can see some of uh, the warning signs if somebody's isolated, yep. depression, something's going on, you could, um, you could maybe see that faster than somebody else. So we do have a bill um, that is in this uh, larger package policy bill. So I'm hoping that that education bill will come through, but we'll see. I mean, it's right now it's, yeah. Oh, so but yeah, I mean, I, outside of that, it, it will be looking to the next session. And um, I just would encourage people if they're tuned in, uh, if you are watching this and you care about mental health yourself, um, I, I would make sure to think about your own self care. We talk a, a lot about this in mental health is how are you doing your self care? How are you taking care of yourself, taking moments mm -hmm. for you, um, going for a walk, creating that self care routine too. It's maybe it's not only just work, but it's take going on a walk, reading a book, taking time. Um, I always have my nightly tea. Um, so making sure you have that, mm -hmm. find ways to connect with your friends. Um, nothing can be more important than maintaining those friendships. Um, eat healthy, all those things. I mean, those are just such important things. If people care about mental health, um, it's, it's take care of your mental health before you can take care of others. But the other thing I would really say for me, um, which has always been helpful for me, I, I struggled with really high anxiety my whole life and I'll speak to like hundreds of people um, because I believe in it. I believe in that work. So find mm -hmm. things that you're passionate about and help others. Um, mm. I grew up in a family that was really poor and my grandfather volunteered a lot and he, he did it because Heather, he said, Heather, it does so much for me. And it's true. It will make you feel good. Um, you don't have to always have money to, to volunteer or to help others. You can volunteer your time mm -hmm. and sometimes that's more valuable than anything. So, um, anyways, those would yeah. be my tip for, for folks if they tune in or if they watch this, but yeah. Yeah. Uh. It's been an well, honor. I know you're very busy. I, I really look forward to getting to know you better. I think that's one thing that the legislature benefits from is everybody brings their own experience and not just their own expertise, but their own experience. So your experience growing up, I, I would really like to hear more about that. I think um, as a mental health expert, you look at things from a different perspective than I might as an engineer and working together, we bring, you know, all of those perspectives to solve things in different ways. So please keep doing your good work. I really appreciate your per, your views tonight and I appreciate um, the insight you have. So thanks for your energy and your commitment to go back when you're already probably have put in a 12 hour day. So no. it's an honor and I, I, I just wanna get you to the Capitol. I think you would be wonderful <laughs> there. 201 lawmakers, we all have different backgrounds. And yep. that's so incredibly important when I think about it from therapists to engineers, we have pipe fitters, we have teachers, mm -hmm. we have every, lawyers and doctors. Um, it's so incredibly important. All of our experiences influence how we make policy. So thank you. I'm so happy you care about mental health and I look forward to maybe uh, doing a bill together. Yeah. Okay, good. Next year. Thanks, yes, Heather. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.